In this class, we're reviewing Old Testament prophecy that predicts the coming of the Messiah. Last week, we reviewed scriptures related to miracles done by prophets. We spoke of the miracles of Moses from Exodus 4, uh, 1 through 9, and the miracle of Elijah from 1 Kings 18, 19 through 40. We talked about the Bible teaching us to look at the evidence from Deuteronomy 18, verses 21 to 22, and John 10, verses 37 to 39. We saw that the Messiah would heal people from Isaiah 35, 4 through 6, and Isaiah 29, 18 through 19. And we saw that the Messiah, filled with God's Spirit, would do miracles other than just healing from Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and Luke 4, 17 through 21, we saw that Jesus, as a prophet, heals and raises the dead. And that was in Matthew 12, 9 through 23, Luke 7, 15 through 23, Mark 5, 35 through 42, John 11, 32 through 46, Mark 5, 1 through 20, John 9, 1 through 12, Mark 2, 1 through 12, and Mark 1, 40 through 45. We saw that Jesus also does other miracles from John 2, 1 through 11, Luke 5, 1 through 11, John 6, 1 through 14, Matthew 14, 22 through 23, and Mark 4, 35 through 41. And that was pretty much the end of last week's lesson because it took us all that time to get there. If you would, bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we can be here this morning to read your word and to learn what it has to say for us. We pray that you would help us to understand it in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I'm going to talk about types and analogs and... There are many things in the Old Testament which symbolically foreshadow things in the New Testament without actually saying that it means a specific fulfillment or event. And sometimes the New Testament explicitly says what the meaning is, or it will say, this is to fulfill what has been written, and it quotes it. Now, the word for type in Greek is tupos, and it means the die or cast that leaves an impression when it is struck into the material. For example, when coins are struck, the die is pounded into the blank slug to leave the heads or tails impression on the face or the back of the coin. Or if you happen to have an old manual typewriter and you look at the keys, the key which strikes the paper through the inked ribbon is a reverse of the letter being struck. In either case, the image produced is a faithfully accurate representation of the reverse image in the die. Now, that's literal, and what we're talking about is kind of more metaphorical or symbolic or parabolic. That is, it's like a parallel thing. Um, And sometimes the Bible says, you know, this means this, and we can look at it and say, okay. Other times we use analogs or analogies, um, which is only a close, pardon me, a close approximation of the actual image. For example, well, this, this isn't a good, very good example of what's in the Bible, but the clock on the wall behind you is an analog clock. It doesn't tell you the actual digital time. Instead, it has two hands moving in a circle of 12 numbers, and it's up to us to interpret the position of those hands to understand that, for example, half past nine is close enough to 9.35 to be about the right time. <clears throat> I would say an analog um, illustration in the Old Testament might be, for example, the visions of Daniel where he's looking in the visions at night and he sees this ram with multiple horns, you know, heading off 
in every direction and he has to have an angel come by and interpret it for him so that he knows what it means. Otherwise, you know, we're just clueless. That's more analog than digital. It's not a plain text prophecy. So I've listed a number of types and analogs of a coming Messiah on the sheet that you have uh, handed out, and I want to go through some of these. The first one uh, is Adam's sin in the garden. We read in Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verses 1 through 6, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Now the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 13 through 19, begins this way. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. And if I was the one picking types and analogs, I would not have picked Adam because I have no or little idea why the Bible here says he is a type. But when we read on, verse 15 says, but the free gift, that is the gift of grace and life from God, is not like the transgression, that is the transgression of Adam. For if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. So he's trying to compare Adam bringing sin and death into the world which affected all men with Christ who brought life and um, according to this the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man brought that and it affected many or abounded to the many the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned for on the one hand the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation but on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. I don't know what to tell you about that. Because it doesn't, it's not like a one-to-one -one fit in my head, where you have one to many and then many to one. But the Bible is saying there's a comparison to be made here. Okay, verse 17, for if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, that is, Adam sinned, he brings in sin and death, death reigns and it spreads to everybody. Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So Jesus comes in, and gives us the gift of righteousness and life. And that spreads to the many. So you do have this kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence here between one man bringing something, spreading to everybody. That's why I guess they're using Adam as a type of Jesus. They're comparing it. And they're saying it's like kind of like a mirror image in a sense 
Verse 18 goes on to say, So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. Now this, to me, makes a lot of sense because they're saying, here you have one person bringing something, spreading to everybody. Verse 19 says the same thing. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. So he keeps saying this type. He's comparing Adam to Jesus. And he does this over and over and over and over until maybe we get it through our head that God knew from the beginning what was going to happen and figured out what he wanted to do to resolve it. Um, My understanding of this, because Jesus, I'm sorry, there's a passage in the Bible that says, raises the question, if something which is clean touches something which is not clean, does that make the not clean thing clean? And, of course, the scribes and Pharisees or whoever say no, because, you know, if you have something unclean and it touches anything, it makes that unclean too. So the whole life under the law of sin and death was a matter of avoiding contamination. If you come into contact with anything unclean, it spreads the uncleanness and you have to go through rituals in order to regain your status of being clean or pure. But life under the gift of God's grace spreads purification by contact with Jesus Christ. So this is kind of reverse in that, and we talked about this um, in the past classes, where the leper comes up to Jesus and says, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus reaches out and touches him and says, I will, you know, and he heals him of the leprosy. So it's like contact with Jesus purifies and heals and cleanses us from sin. Second um, type I am going to say would be sacrifice or atoning sacrifice in and I'm going to start with Genesis chapter 4 verses 2 through 8 but from the beginning and this is way before Moses way before the flood but from the beginning blood sacrifice became required for redemption before God or to have a relationship with God to be pleasing to God and we could ask ourselves why And I think it's because the wages of sin is death, and it takes a death to atone for the sins of life. So from the beginning, they were using this substitute death in order to atone for their, our um, sins or impurities or lack of perfection. We read in Genesis chapter 4, Verses 2 through 8. Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Cain was the farmer, and Abel was the shepherd. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. So as far... We don't know this, but the Bible, as far as we know, 
the only people in the world are Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. I don't believe that's quite true because Adam and Eve went on to have many other children and I don't think that they waited for Cain and Abel to grow up before that happened. But as far as the Bible tells us, so far they haven't told us about anybody else. And here you have Adam, Eve, their sons Cain and Abel, and Cain kills Abel. From the beginning, we have lying by Satan and murder. And it gets worse from there as time goes on. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, beginning in verses 18 through 22, therefore, even the first covenant, and he's talking about the law of Moses, was not inaugurated without blood, for when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Just like to stop and make a comment, hyssop, I'm guessing, is kind of like a weed because it seems to be everywhere in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's a comment from Hebrews. Third example of symbols and types and analogies. The Passover lamb. From Exodus 20, I'm sorry, Exodus 12, verses 21 through 23, then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin, and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the two doorposts. None of you shall go outside the door of the, his house until morning, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptian, Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come in to your houses to smite you. He had already talked about the Passover lamb, that they were to choose a lamb that was spotless, without blemish. Uh, we read also in Exodus 12, uh, begin, same chapter, verses 43 through 46, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is an ordinance of the Passover, no foreigner is to eat of it, but every man's slave purchased with money after you have circumcised him, then he may eat of it. A sojourner or a hired servant shall not eat of it. It is to be eaten in a single house, you are not to bring forth any of the flesh outside of the house, nor are you to break any bone of it. This is one of the things which we would compare to Jesus because we read about that in the uh, Gospel of John, and we'll get to that. In Matthew 26, verses 19 through 20, the disciples prepared uh, the Passover as Jesus instructed and in verses 26 through 29, we read, While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. <coughs> and I read that because there's an interesting thing we're going to get to about the crucifixion where um, Jesus says, I'm thirsty, and they dip sour wine in a sponge, put it on a stalk of hyssop, and raise it up to him on the cross. And to me, this is like, because Jesus said of the fruit of the vine, this is my blood. This is like what they were doing on the Passover with the blood of the Passover lamb on the doorposts and the lintel. In John uh, 19, verses 4 through 7, Pilate came out again and said to, him, said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. This is after Jesus was arrested in, in his trial. 
Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold, a man. So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify, crucify. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Twice Pilate said this in this, these few verses. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he made himself out to be the Son of God. And Pilate eventually succumbs to their bad behavior, I guess, and sends Jesus out to be crucified. On the cross, John 19, 28 through 37, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also may believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. And that scripture is speaking of the Passover lamb in Exodus 12.46, Numbers 9.12. But that phrase, not a bone of him shall be broken, is also in Psalms 34.20, referring to the Messiah. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. That's from Zechariah 12.10. You guys might have to write that down because I didn't include those scriptures on your list. Uh, another, I'm sorry. Another type or analogy that I would like to bring up is that of the scapegoat carrying away the sins. In Leviticus 16, 7 through 10, God's instructions to Aaron, the priest, is he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell and make it a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as the scapegoat. This is where this phrase comes from, the scapegoat, and it basically means that goat escapes into the wilderness. Then uh, Leviticus 16, 21 through 22, Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat, that is the scapegoat, and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to a solitary lamb, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. In Isaiah 53, and I'm just going to take snippets of these verses, Verse 5, verse 10, verse 11, verse 12. But if, if you read these, it says, He, that is the Messiah, was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, my servant will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. So from the passages in Isaiah 53, we see that the Messiah is carrying the sins of everybody like the scapegoat carried the sins of Israel away. Another type or symbol that we have or come across is Abraham was told to sacrifice Isaac, his son, in Genesis 22, beginning in verse 1, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, 
and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Verse 9, then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. <coughs> and Abraham looks up and finds a ram caught in a thicket by its horns, and he uses that as the sacrifice. Verse 15, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And this image of a father sacrificing his son or killing his son as a sacrifice shows up very strongly in the New Testament if you recall uh, John 3.16, right? And my mind just went blank. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. <coughs> so this is the image in the New Testament of the Messiah is that God is giving up his son to death. But this image of a sacri father sacrificing his own son is uh, very disturbing to some people. That Jesus was called the son of God, we, you can read in 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18, for where he tells you about what happened on the mount when he was up there and God spoke from heaven to say, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And you, you can look up that in the Gospels as well. We see that the Messiah is prophesied to be God's son in Psalms 2-7, where it says, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord, Jehovah. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And it really bothers some people because they think it's unusually cruel for God to send someone else to earth to suffer and die for the sins of the world. However, the Messiah is not a son of God like Hercules is supposedly the son of Zeus, where they are two uniquely different people. Jesus did not claim to be only the son of God. He claimed to be God himself in human form. We see this in John 8, 58 through 59, where Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. And again, in John 10, verses 30 and 31, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I, will give, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. But it isn't just the New Testament talking about Jesus, where Jesus is claiming to be God. It says this in Psalms 45, verses 6 and 7, as we read three weeks ago. Verse 6, Psalms 45, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of, righteous, a scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore... God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. That phrase, therefore God, your God, has anointed you, is saying that the Messiah is God. Because of verse 7, when you go back, 
and see. It says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. But who is he talking about? We assumed he was talking about God, Jehovah. We assumed that. But when you get to the next verse, where it says, your throne, O God, I'm sorry, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, Jehovah God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. So if the previous verse is talking about the Messiah, it's calling him God. And this is in the Old Testament, not just the New Testament. That scripture, if you want to write it down, Psalms 45, 6 and 7, verses 6 and 7, is not on your paper there. Psalms 45 verses 6 and 7. The, the nature of God is confusing. Paul says in Acts 20, 28, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. And I, I read that phrase over again, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And it sounds like he's saying, God purchased the church with his own blood. And when you read that verse, you go back in it, there is, seems to be no other way you can take the pronoun his own blood or he purchased with his own blood, you can't take that pronoun back to anything other than God in that verse. It just doesn't connect to anything. <coughs> okay. Also, other, another symbol or uh, type is Zechariah. And okay, in Zechariah chapter three, verses eight and nine, God Himself says, <coughs> "Now listen, Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you. Indeed, they are men who are a symbol." And that word, in other translations, has been um, translated as sign meaning miracle, and the my brain, the Amplified Bible has a footnote that says, or type of something in the future. Y they are a sign or type of something. But God is saying, you the men are a symbol, for behold, I am going to bring in my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have set, set before Joshua, on one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord Jehovah of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. This tells us several things. Joshua and his friends are called a symbol, a sign, or even a type, an echo of things to come. Notice that, historically speaking, the successor to Moses was named Joshua. And the prophet Zechariah makes a crown and places it on the head of Joshua, the high priest, to show that the Messiah would be both a king and a priest. That's in Zechariah 6.11. Also, this has God saying that he is going to bring in his servant, the branch, and that he will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. This implies that some event will occur in one day which will accomplish the forgiveness of sins. Also in Zechariah 6.12, God says of Joshua, Behold, the man whose name is Branch. And the passage goes on to say that this man will build a temple and will reign as a priest upon the throne. That is, the offices of king and the offices of priest will be held by one person. And... Those are things which the historical Joshua the high priest did not do. So if God calls Joshua the branch, 
does that mean that the branch, the Messiah, would be named Joshua or Yeshua? That's a stretch. You know, the Bible doesn't explicitly come out and say that. Another uh, type or symbol is Moses lifting up the bronze serpent in the wilderness. In Numbers 21, verses 6 through 9, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. That means he prayed to God and said, you know, please do something about this. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard, and it came about that if a serpent bit any man when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. This is the source of the symbol of the snake going up the pole, which is the symbol of um, medicine. <clears throat> it's called a caduceus. Uh, there's a symbol with two snakes going up a cross, which is used on a little round button for the medical corps of the United States Army, I know, because I used to wear one many years ago. But it's interesting to me that God didn't just go poof and get rid of the serpents. He had Moses do something which was against the law, make a bronze serpent and put it on a standard and lift it up and everybody who looks at it will live. That particular bronze serpent got destroyed in the time of, uh, in 2 Kings 18, verse 1 Hez says, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. And verse 4 says, he removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah. Those were the idols in the land. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. So it's like people seem to keep wanting to worship what they can see instead of God. <coughs> John chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world but that the world might be saved through him. This is Jesus prophesying that he will eventually be lifted up. I'm not... I've only got two of these left, I think. Joseph is one of the few people in the Bible of whom not very many bad things are said. The only thing he did was sort of put the screws to his brothers. Um, after they had treated him badly. <coughs> in Genesis, this is in Genesis chapters 37 and chapter 39 through 50, so it goes on and on and on. But in chapter 37, verse 23, we read, So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water in it. And you have to understand why they did this. Joseph was 17 years old. He was the youngest son. He gave bad reports about his older brothers to his father. They didn't like him for that. He had dreams that said everybody was going to bow down to him, and his brothers didn't like that. And so they were just sick and tired of him, I guess. It says, Then they sat down to eat a meal, and as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. Judah said, said to his brothers, 
What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh, and his brothers listen to him. Then some Midianite traders came by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. <coughs> okay. I'm going to have to summarize a whole bunch of this. Joseph goes down into Egypt. He is sold to Potiphar, the chief of the guard of Pharaoh. And he does very well in Potiphar's house. He has responsibility for everything in the household. And he takes really good care of it. And God blesses Joseph and God blesses Potiphar for having Joseph do all this work. But Joseph was falsely accused, so he was thrown into prison. While he's into prison, again, God is with him. And he is given responsibility and upholds it very well. Uh, while he is there, the Pharaoh's chief baker and his cupbearer were thrown into jail for a few days. And they both have dreams. Joseph interpreted those dreams. And as he interpreted them, so they came true. The cupbearer was restored to his position and the baker was hanged. Two years later... Pharaoh has a dream. He dreams of seven really good ears of corn on one stalk, and after them come seven really withered and shriveled ears of corn that wipe out the good corn. And he dreams again, and he has seven big fat cows on the banks of the Nile, I guess. And then after them come seven really scrawny withered cows that, you know, kind of, destroy or eat up the good cows and Joseph interprets this dream for him to say there's going to be seven years of great plenty followed by seven years of extreme famine and what we should do is save up a fifth of all of the grain that we get in the good years so that we'll have something when we have seven years of famine and this comes to pass and Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of the whole land of Egypt Joseph is number two in the whole land this is one reason why <coughs> Joseph is an analogy here. The Messiah, Jesus to us, is number two in heaven. God is number one. God has given all authority under him to Jesus. Joseph's brothers come back or go down to Egypt to buy grain. Joseph sees them, but they don't recognize him because he is speaking Egyptian and he's talking through an interpreter and he's probably dressed up like King Tut. You know, he's got the headdress and all of this stuff. So they just don't know who he is and he doesn't reveal himself at that time. He puts them all in jail for three days. He then says, okay, you guys can go back to, but you have to bring back your youngest brother and I'm going to keep Simeon here while you go. So he keeps Simeon in jail because Joseph was in jail for quite a few years. So he puts Simeon in jail and they go back to their father and their father doesn't want to let them take Benjamin back to Egypt, but <clears throat> they have to. They're going to die without food. So they take Benjamin back and they go into the house of Joseph. Well, actually, Joseph does another trick on him. He puts his cup in Benjamin's sack, and as they leave, he chases after him and says, you stole my cup, you know, and so they search the sacks and find the cup in Benjamin's sack, and they all come back to Joseph, and the brothers are s saying, you know, why did we mistreat our brother to start with? You know, we're paying for our sins here. <clears throat> okay so Joseph finally um, says to his brothers he reveals himself and says I am your brother Joseph this is in I don't know what chapter it's in sorry it's in verse 4 ha! I am Joseph whom you sold into e I'm sorry 42 chapter 42 whom you sold into Egypt, do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life, for 
there's going to be five more years of famine. And he says, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. You know, bring everybody down and I will provide for you because we have all of this famine to go. And it says, he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. He kissed all his brothers, this is verse 15, and wept on them, and afterwards his brothers talked with him. So they reconcile, and Joseph is saying, God put me in this position to save you guys. And this is why this is a parallel with the Messiah, with Jesus, because God put Jesus in that position to be the sacrifice which saves everybody. The last uh, symbol we have is jo Jonah being three days in the belly of the fish. Jonah 1.17 says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Matthew 12, 38 through 40, some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, that is to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign that is a miracle from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And those were all of the types and symbols that I could come up with off the top of my head, but as I thought about it later, we could also talk about propitiation, which is a word that we kind of mean an atoning sacrifice, but really it means the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, which stands between God and the law that people have to, had to keep. You know, it's what is in between God and us, so God doesn't see our failures of the law. He sees Jesus. Thank you for coming, and hopefully next week we can get into Isaiah 53. That's the plan.